Today I'll be discussing another image processing IP. And this IP is specifically for something called histogram equalization. Before going to the video coding, we will look at the theory behind it. So consider one image here. So you can say the image looks quite uh, washed out. Or we can say there is not enough contrast in the image so that we can recognize different parts of the image. Why this is happening? So if you try to plot the histogram of this image, so basically it's a grayscale image, pixels can take any value from uh, 0 to 255. Each pixel is using one byte for representing the gray level. So if you plot the histogram, between number of pixels at each gray level, you will find out the histogram is quite skewed actually. Okay, so it's not taking all the possible gray levels, it is taking a few gray levels. That is why uh, we feel like there is not enough contrast in the image. So we can enhance the image uh, by distributing pixels to more gray levels. Uh, here you can see one such case where we do some image processing operation and make the histogram more distributed. Once you do like that, yeah, there is enough contrast in the image and you should be able to see the different parts of the image quite clearly. Here is the histogram of this image uh, after I do a certain operation. So one popular technique used for enhancing contrast is called histogram equalization. Now this background about histogram equalization I have taken from Wikipedia for easier understanding. So basically in histogram equalization, we will use a mapping function which will be used to map a gray level in the input image to another gray level in the output image. So first step here is to find a so-called the cumulative histogram. The cumulative histogram at a gray level is defined as number of pixels at that particular gray level or less than that. So here, uh, for example, a simple image is taken, eight by eight image, and in the second image, the corresponding gray levels are man. If you, again, in the table format, histogram is given. So basically, we have a pixel at 52. We have three pixels at 55, and then so forth. So this is basically the histogram. If I want to find cumulative histogram at each gray level, you find the number of pixels at that level as well as less than that level. Okay, for 59, I have three plus two plus three plus one, nine as my cumulative histogram. So this, this corresponds to the cumulative histogram. So next, once you find the cumulative histogram, we will have a mapping function. And this is the mapping function used in this particular histogram equalization. So for, for a gray level L, the new gray level uh, in the output image will be cumulative histogram at L minus minimum cumulative histogram in the image divided by total number of pixels in the image minus the minimum histogram, minimum cumulative histogram, times the number of gray levels in the image. In our case, uh, since we are using eight bits, bits per pixel, we will be having 256 uh, gray levels. So L minus one will be 255 here. And again, from this particular table, we can see L minimum will be Okay, look at the previous one. L minimum will be one, and that corresponds to level C. So using this equation, uh, once I map, I will get the new level. That means in the original image, if I have a pixel at gray level 59, in my output image, 
that corresponding pixel will be having a gray level of 32. So from the table itself, you can see now the gray levels are uh, quite distributed. I have gray levels starting from zero all the way to gray level 255. A few interesting things are uh, you do not see levels less than 52 here because those gray levels, uh, they do not exist in the image itself. Okay, so that's why they are not shown here. So there is no point in finding the mapping for them because they do not exist there. Same way, I, I do not see anything greater than 155 here because those uh, levels, they also do not exist in the original image. But in the output image, we have all the gray levels starting from 0 to 255. So here again, there is the comparison between input and output. You can see the histogram, it got uh, more widely distributed. Now we will look at the basic hardware implementation, how it can be done. So we will be having a bottom-up approach. We'll be building small modules for doing particular operation. Then we will be combining them to uh, get the entire image processing. The first modules uh, that we will be uh, developing will be to find a cumulative histogram at a single grade level. Okay, so here is the basic idea. So I'll have a computer there that will be comparing my input pixel level with the gray level for which it is finding the cumulative histogram. So if the input pixel is less than or equal to this particular gray level, it will be incrementing a counter. So here we are assuming a streaming interface. I assume pixels are uh, continuously coming and we have a pixel valid to indicate whether this is a valid pixel or not. This looks similar to AXI stream interface standard without a ready signal. And by the time the entire image passes through this module, I will have the cumulative histogram for a particular gray level. So one module is calculating the gray level for only uh, one particular gray level. So the basic idea is you replicate this module in our case, 256 times. And we parallelly process the image so that by the time I pass the entire image, I will have the corresponding cumulative histogram at each level. I'll be getting in parallel. Now, another module that we'll be using will be the module to find the minimum cumulative histogram because for our mapping function, we need the minimum histogram cumulative histogram also. One trivial method that might come into your mind is, yeah, we find the cumulative histogram first, but then among them, we find the smallest value because that is the minimum cumulative histogram. But that will be taking more number of clock cycles because you, you pass the image. After that, you find the smallest number here. Again, you might not be able to do it in one clock cycle because that may result in a large population cycle. So you'll be wasting additional clock cycles. But by using a very simple logic, uh, the same streaming data, we can pass to a different module and that will be able to find the minimum cumulative histogram. We will be seeing the code later, but basic idea is uh, I'll have some register which will be storing the uh, current minimum K level for which the minimum cumulative histogram is obtained. So basically, the idea is even if you look at our uh, uh, table of cumulative histogram, you will observe that uh, the lowest gray level in the input image that will be having the least cumulative histogram. That's the basic idea we are using here also. So here, I, I might initialize my minimum gray level with the maximum possible gray level. For example, in our case, I might initialize it with uh, 255. And whenever I get my input pixel, I will compare that gray level with this gray level. If this gray level is less than this one, I will replace it with this uh, current gray level. If it is less than or equal to this gray level, I might increment this counter. And if this gray level, whenever it is less than, the value I currently store, I will again store this as my minimum gray level and I will reset my counter to one. 
So that's the basic logic that we are using. So again, by the time I pass my enter image, I will have the minimum gray level here, which I am not interested. But the corresponding cumulative histogram for that gray level uh, will be available here. So this module can sit in parallel with all these modules, and I can pass the same input pixel and input pixel value to this module also. Next one, uh, we'll be using the module to do the mapping operation. We have already seen the equation before. So this uh, mapper, it will be getting the cumulative histogram at every level, which will be coming uh, from this module. So we got them in parallel. Uh, they will be coming here in parallel. Also, we have the minimum cumulative histogram also coming here. So it will be doing uh, that mapping operation and it will be providing us the new level. It also takes the uh, total number of pixels or the image size as a parameter. Now, you might be able to do this also in a single clock cycle by doing it in parallel. You may end up in using large number of resources. So we may choose to do it in a sequential manner. That means we will be uh, finding one new level in one clock cycle, and we may spend say 255 clock cycles for finding all the gray levels. In my implementation, I am using a sequential method to do it. You may try to do it in parallel also. Okay, you'll be spending more resources. That's the side effect. Now, once we have this uh, mapping, we are ready to generate the output image. For that, I have all the new gray levels, uh, which are coming from here. That goes basically to a MUX. And the MUX uh, looks at the original image again, and it will generate the output image. Again, we assume a streaming interface here. So a particular gray level or a particular pixel will be coming here, and the MUX will choose its new corresponding gray level from here, and that will be going as an output. So basically, this uh, histogram equalization that requires uh, the image to pass twice. Because first of all, we need to find the cumulative histogram. Only after finding the cumulative histogram, we will be able to do the mapping. And for finding the cumulative histogram, we need to see the entire image. So in the first pass, we'll be uh, finding the cumulative histogram as well as these new levels. And in the second pass, we'll be using those new levels to generate the output image. So this is a two-pass operation. So because of that, we cannot implement it as a pure streaming interface. If it is a purely streaming interface, we stream the image once and we should be getting the output. That doesn't happen here. We need to stream it twice. First to find the cumulative histogram and the new level, and second time to generate the output image. So since we are uh, going to use a streaming interface, again, my assumption is initially image will be sitting in the DDR memory. We need to take it from DDR and stream to our IP. For this purpose, we may use the AXI DMA controller. But again, for this implementation, I want it to be an independent IP. So I'm not trying to use the uh, Nylinx DMA controller. Instead of that, we will add the logic inside the IP, which will be reading from DDR the image, as well as it will be writing the processed image back to DDR memory. So that also will add within the IP itself. So basically, this is the idea, uh, like I showed. We have the cumulative histogram calculator. From there, we get the cumulative histogram. In parallel to that, we have the minimum cumulative histogram calculator. From there, we will be getting the minimum cumulative histogram. They will be going to this uh, level calculator, which will be giving the levels, which will be going to the mapper. So in the second pass, the mapper, it gets these levels from the level calculator. And we assume the original image will be streamed again to the mapper uh, for the second time. At that time, the mapper will be doing the mapping operation. Now I have an image reader logic here, which will be used for 
reading image from DDR. So that it will be happening through XI4 uh, full interface, and it will be converting it into XI stream. Same way, once we, we, we do the mapping operation, the output should be stored back to the memory that I have a XS stream to memory right, area memory right logic, which I am calling as the image right. Now there will be a control logic, which basically does uh, all the control operations. For example, it decides uh, when to read from memory. And of course, we need to read twice. So when to read first time, when to read the second time, that is decided by the control logic. Same way, uh, like I said, I'll be taking 255 clock cycles for calculating this uh, new level. So when to start this calculation, and that is again decided by the control logic. Same way, uh, there will be control signal going to the image writer. And only when this signal comes, it will be starting writing the process image to the memory. Now, ultimately, I need to interface the IP with a processor. And the control logic requires certain information from the software side also. For example, where is the image sitting in the DDR and where the store image should be stored after processing. Those information will be supplied by the software. So software will be configuring them in some uh, registries. And the control logic will be taking it from those registries. So we basically need a bunch of registries, which we call as the register file. Now, for the processor to write to this register, we need some kind of interface. I'll be using a XI Lite interface for that purpose. So basically, our IP, it will have a XI Lite interface for interfacing with the processor. And we'll have a XI4 master interface for reading and writing from the memory. One XI is required enough for reading and writing from memory because image reader, it is using only the read channel and image writer it is using only the write channel so one master interface is enough uh, for for both these logic this will be using the read channel and this will be using the write channel this is the theoretical background now we will be looking at the source code for this we'll start with the code for the Simulate the histogram calculator. So, like in the slide, I have shown uh, this basically contains a compressor and a counter, and it will be calculating the simulated histogram for a particular level. So, the levels for which it is uh, doing the histogram calculation that is passed as a parameter here. So, at the time of instantiation, uh, we will be able to specify the level for which it will be doing the cumulative histogram calculation. So here is my streaming interface, and this is the cumulative histogram. So, so you can see everything is parameterized, and uh, finally it is parameterized for input data width of eight, and it operates for an image of size 640 by 480. So the initial picture I showed you, uh, this is the size of that image, uh, so one one drawback of current implementation is this implementation works only for this particular image size. If you want to change the image size, you have to re-implement the hardware. Okay, so we may discuss at the end why that restriction is there, how to overcome it. Instead of hard coding it, maybe the size can come from a, a register which the software can configure. That is one possibility which will make the implementation more more scalable. Anyway, so uh, whenever reset is received, we reset the cumulative histogram to zero. And whenever we get a pixel, a pixel value is high. And if the pixel value is less than this particular level, we increment the cumulative histogram. So that's the basic idea. Now, later we'll be instantiating this particular module 256 times to calculate the cumulative histogram of 256 level. Now, next module is the one used to find the minimum cumulative histogram. Okay, so here it is. Again, we have the same streaming interface, and this is the output, which is the 
minimum capability histogram. Again, idea is whenever there is a reset, uh, we reset to zero, minimum capability histogram. And this corresponds to uh, this one, which is the current minimum gray level. I am directly initializing it to two to the power of data with minus one. So in our case, it will be initialized to 255. So whenever I get a new pixel, and pixel value is high, and if the current pixel is same as the minimum level that I currently have, I'll be incrementing the CDF min. The CDF min is nothing but my counter here, which will be giving me the minimum cumulative historical. But if the pixel that I receive is less than the current minimum, I will reset this counter to one and I will replace my minimum level to the pixel that I receive. Yeah. If the pixel is greater than current minimum, yeah, we simply ignore it. We don't look at it. If it is equal, we increment the counter. If it is less, we reset the counter and store that pixel value as the current minimum. So that's the basic logic here. Now this file is equalizer. Uh, this is somewhat intermediate level of uh, high level uh, module. We'll discuss the control logic later. So this is the code block where we are instantiating our cumulative histogram calculator 256 times. So in wetlock we have this uh, generate statement using which we can easily do it instead of copy pasting it 256 times. Uh, we can simply write a generate statement and during implementation, in our case we were now, it will be unrolling this loop and it will be instantiating it 256 times for you. Okay. One main thing is this, this generate doesn't correspond to any hardware implementation or anything. This is a shortcut for instantiation in our case. Instead of we type it 256 times, we use a shortcut and the tool will unroll it for us. So here you can see we have a loop control variable, the generate variable i, and that i is parameter map to compare value. So that's how we get the simulated histogram value for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So each module will be calculating for one particular gray level. Here is the CDF minimum calculator that we have seen. And uh, you will see same input pixel and input pixel value. So basically the same streaming interface it is going to both of this module. So once I Part my entire image, I will have the minimum cumulative histogram here and all the cumulative histogram values here. Now, here again, one interesting point is this CDF valves. So I have declared it as a single dimensional array. That's why uh, here it is written like total width plus number of level times output. So as far as we have concerned, the number of levels are 256. Again, that comes as a parameter here, 2 to our data width, our data width is 8. And output depends upon our image size, which will be log of total number of pixels. Again, this is declared as uh, one dimensional because later we'll be passing these values to the uh, calculator, the level calculator. And in Wedlock, again, there is a rule like your input output ports cannot be two dimensional. It's two dimensional in some sense refers to memory. It need not be always a memory, but it, it shows kind of uh, memory implementation. So that is not allowed in Wedlow. Maybe system Wedlow, we might be able to do it. So this input to uh, this particular module, uh, it cannot be two dimensional. That's why this is mapped to one dimensional. Otherwise, we would have done here now int levels minus one colon zero as one dimensional and output minus one colon zero as the second dimension. Because of this restriction, this is mapped like that. And uh, here this mapping is also interesting. So this also, uh, you can go and check if you haven't seen this style. Uh, here you can see i times output plus colon output. Again, this style is used instead of using the variable i here as well as here. Uh, because in Vivado, 
or at least in synthesizable variable, there is a core uh, rule like you cannot have a variable at both sides of this column when you uh, select a particular width from a larger class. That's why this style is used. Okay, so next module, uh, this is basically the one which is the mapping function calculation. So again, to save resources, I am not doing it in parallel. I am doing it in sequential. So because of that, I'll be using a state machine here. So initially, it will be in some idle state. And once it gets the start calculation signal, then only it starts the calculation. So this start cal uh, signal will be provided by the control logic. And control logic will be making the signal high only after our image, uh, entire image passes through the module one. So it makes sure the output of all cumulative histogram calculators are valid. Only after that, the signal will be made high. Then it will go to the calc state. And here it does the calculation. Basically, it does uh, this equation. Uh, this equation, it does it in three clock cycles. Again, pipelining is added there. That's why it is not done in one clock. It takes three clock cycles to do that operation. Again, for satisfying timing requirement. Otherwise, it may break the time if we do it in one one clock. Same way, uh, this calculation will be using one DSP slice instead of you do it sequentially. If you do it in parallel, altogether you will you will require two fifty six DSP slices. It depends upon your SPG. If you have enough DSP, you can do it in parallel. If you do not have enough, you may want to do it in sequential. So in my case, I'm consuming only one DSP slice because I am doing it in sequential manner. Okay, so uh, the basic idea is, yeah, so here I have the cumulative histogram at a particular level i. So i is basically my loop control variable that will be going from zero all the way to 255. Again, many people, they make the mistake of writing a for loop here to calculate it. If you are planning to do a, a sequential implementation, that kind of for loop is not going to work. If you are planning to do it in parallel in one shot, yes, you might be able to do it. But if you want to calculate it uh, one level per clock cycle, you shouldn't be writing a for loop directly. You need to do something like that. So my loop variable will be incrementing by one on every clock edge. If you write it using a for loop, uh, in sense, uh, some sense, it says like in one clock, edge, I should change from zero to two fifty five, okay, which doesn't make sense. But if you want to do it in a parallel operation, yeah, that makes sense because that infers some kind of parallel implementation. Okay, so first thing uh, I'm doing is yeah, so using this I value, I'll be using one particular cumulative histogram. So this I frequency uh, that is coming from my cumulative histogram calculators. So I take one cumulative histogram and I subtract PDF min from that, which is basically this operation. That's the first thing that we do. Second operation, I multiply that one with number of levels minus one. Yeah, that makes sense. That is this L minus one, second one. Third operation is I divide it with something called this division factor, and I multiply it with something called as multiplication factor. Okay, so here are certain reasons why why it is done like this. So SPGAs in general, they are very, very bad at doing division operations. So we cannot blame it because there are no algorithms, efficient algorithms, which can do division operation in a single clock cycle. Multiplication you might be able to do in a single clock cycle because there are algorithms which can efficiently do it in single clock cycle uh, using array multiplier and all. And inside of PGA, we have DSP slices, which are quite good at doing multiplication. But it is not at all efficient in doing division operation. Actually, in fact, until a few years back, 
it was not possible to use this divide operator directly in Vivado. There was no support for that unless your denominator is a power of two. If it is a power of two, there is no real division operation, you know. And there is not even shifting operation, although we say division is uh, shifting. Only by manipulating how wires are connected, the division operation is implemented. But now the division is supported and the uh, denominator need not be power of two. But that will create a huge combinational circuit and that will hit your timing. That is one reason why the image size uh, is kept as a constant here, because we have the image size in the denominator here. So if I directly put it there, it will be inferring a huge combinational circuit and, uh, and performance will be bad. Now, if you want to do it like that, you want to make the implementation quite scalable and you could could work with different image size and you need to give the image size to a register. Again, this operation, instead of doing it in one clock cycle, you may use an IP for doing division. It is available from the ID. So you can use IP for division, but it might be taking multiple clock cycles for doing the division operation. Okay. So that way we can make the implementation scalable. It may be taking few more clock cycles. And that's the only side effect. But in my implementation, I'm trying to do it in one clock cycle. So when we want to do it in one clock cycle, uh, like I mentioned, if this quotient, uh, sorry, if this uh, denominator, if it is power of two, it can implement it quite efficiently. So what I'm trying to do is I, I will always try to keep this denominator a power of two, and I will multiply the numerator with some number so that the total effect of this multiplication and this division will result in the required division operation. Okay, so in our case, uh, I want to divide it with total number of pixels minus minimum number of cumulative histogram. Okay, here is the second adjustment that I did. Uh, this term I am ignoring from the denominator. I assume the minimum cumulative histogram will be always very small number. Practically also that is the case because this is the smallest cumulative histogram. In most cases, this will be one actually. So that's why I am I'm simply ignoring it. So in our case, uh, we actually want to divide it with the image size. So the image size is 640 times 480. Okay. So you want to divide by this one, or basically you want to multiply by this 3.25 uh, times 10 to the power of minus 6. So instead of doing that, what I'm basically doing is I am multiplying it with 53 and dividing it with this large number. And if you look at this large number, it's the power of 2, actually. Oh, okay. Look at power of two. Here it is. It's the power of two. So if I do fifty-three divided by this this number, you will end up with three point one five times ten to the power of minus six, which is very close to the number which I need. Okay, so that is one kind of optimization done here to do division operation very efficiently. And this is one, one trick we we do sometimes. So actually, there is no division operation here. It will be manipulated only by connecting wires. Only operation that is going to happen is multiplication by 53. It is not a power of two, but still uh, using DSP, it should be able to do that multiplication quite efficiently. So once all calculations are done, it will go back to idle state and it will again wait for this back signal from the control logic uh, for the next image. Next, we have this mapper. Again, uh, this is the input to the mapper, which is coming from here. And so this output 
is actually coming as input here. It also has a streaming interface as input. It has a streaming interface as output also. So basically, this is a kind of a max only. Whenever an input pixel comes, it will choose the new value uh, from here. This is one way of implementing it. You may use uh, ifs or case or anything, but this is the shortest way of doing it. So this does the mapping operation. All these modules are instantiated in this talk module, histicalization. So this we have already seen, uh, cumulative histogram calculator, its output, as well as CDF min. Both are going to this CDF min, both are going to this scale histogram calculator, which is nothing but the one which uh, finds the new level. So the output of that is actually going to the mapper. And the input streaming interface that is also going to the mapper. But for, like I said before, for mapping, the input will be streamed for the second time. So all those are done by the control logic. Okay, so that's also a state machine based implementation. Uh, one control signal that goes to the control logic is the pixel valid signal from the streaming interface. By looking at the pixel valid, the control logic can find out whether our IP has received the entire image or not. So once it finds the entire image has been received, it will make this dark signal to one. It is nothing but the signal used here for doing the histogram calculator. So then it will go and wait here. So here you can see it is waiting for like 255 clock cycle until uh, the mapping function is over. Now, once it finds mapping, it will enable the mapper and also it is sending a control signal to the image reader. We will see that module. And this will cause the image reader to read the image from the DDR for the second time. Then it will go to the complete. And again, it is waiting there until it receives the entire image for the second time. Once it finds like, yeah, it is received for the second time, it will be making some done signal high. And this done will be going to a register, we will see later, uh, which basically shows like the image processing has been over. And it will wait for the start signal to become low before going back to idle state. Again, the start signal will be coming from some uh, register actually. So it will wait for that signal to go low before going to idle. Only because if it goes to idle state without uh, making sure the signal is low, it will be restarting the entire operation again from the beginning. So here you can see start is there. It is giving that start to again image read logic. So it will be reading the image again. Everything repeats. So we don't want that to happen. So again, kind of handshaking. So start will be set by the software and it makes sure that it is cleared before going back to the ID. That's about the control logic. So this is the image reader, which does the reading operation from the DDR memory. So basically, like you can see, it has the XI master read channel signal. All of them are there. In addition to that, there are a few control signals. There is a start signal, which is given by the control logic, uh, which basically says like, okay, you can start reading from the memory. It also has the DDR start address, which basically says what is the starting address from where it should be. Then uh, it has, again, a few things you will observe. The read data uh, is 32 bit. That means it is going to get 32 bit data from PDR. But we are expecting a streaming interface, which has only 8 bit. So from 32, it will convert to 8 bit. And that is this one. So we have 8 bit image data, image data valid, 
image that are ready. So this is basically nothing but a AXI stream interface with data data valid and ready, and it's only eight meter. So uh, again, it is a state machine based. We will look at two important things here. So the bus size is a parameter which is set as 256. That means each read operation going to DDR will be 256. And AR size is kept as uh, 0 and 0, 2. That means each read operation on every clock cycle will be of 4 bytes. Okay, so each on each clock, it will be getting 4 bytes or 32 bit of data. Like that, it will be getting 256 bits in one burst. So basically, one burst operation consists of one kilobyte of data. So whenever it reads uh, image from the memory, it will be making read request to the TDR. And when it makes a read request, it is basically requesting for one kilobyte of data. Again, burst type is one. That means after each read, the address will be automatically incremented. So you have to look at the XI specification to completely understand what each signal base, then you might be able to appreciate it uh, better. So initially, the, uh, the, the image reader is in idle state, and when it gets the start signal, it starts reading. Again, here you can see uh, there is a logic which is used to generate the start P signal. Again, if you look at the logic, you will find out the start P is a technique to find the rising edge of a input signal. So basically, it is trying to detect the rising edge of this I star. Like I said before, this I star will be coming from software and uh, it will get stored in some register. So the start signal will be constantly one. But for one start signal, we want this to operate only one. So we want to find the rising edge of the start signal. So this is a technique, standard technique used to find the rising edge. You take a signal, you delay it, and you do an AND operation between the input signal and it, the not of its delayed version that will give you the right signal. So once it finds a start signal, it will be latching the DDR start address. It will be latching the total uh, image size that has to be read. Then it goes to the state machine. And this is basically AXI master uh, read channel implementation. Okay, so it will be requesting for uh, it will be making AR valid high, basically saying he wants to read and here is the valid address. Once uh, from DDR, we get a response like it is ready. This will be deasserted. Address is provided here. Then it goes and waits for the data. When it gets the data, it will go back to uh, either. No, in this particular case, yeah, it will go back to this state and it will be again reading until it reads the entire data. So whatever data is coming from DDR that is temporarily stored in a buffer. This is basically a FIFO. This is a uh, silent FIFO. Again, FIFO is used one reason uh, the data that we are receiving is 32 bit in size. The stream interface that we need is only 8 bit. So there is a size mismatch, and these FIFOs, they can quite efficiently do that uh, with translation. Okay, so again, if you if you look at the port here, you can see the data coming from DDR. It is written in a particular order, actually. 7 down to 0, 15 down to 8, instead of simply writing XIR data. Uh, that's because how the silent FIFOs are operating. So when you have a 32-bit data at its write port, and if you have only 8-bit data at the read port, in case of silent uh, FIFOs, when you read from the FIFO, the first data that comes out is not 
seven down to zero of the input. Instead of that, 31 down to 24 will be coming out first. So that is their logic. Uh, I also don't know the exact reason for that. That's why the order is reversed here. So that the first data that we get here will be will be seven down to zero out of 31 down to zero. That's why it is stored like that. Now again, uh, you will see what our data is coming out of this FIFO is directly going as the XI stream data. This data value is nothing but not of FIFO empty. So whenever FIFO is not empty, we will say we have a valid data as well as added with this image uh, ready. This is basically coming from an output FIFO. So same module in the image writer, we have another FIFO, which is used for writing to the DDL. So whenever that FIFO has some empty space for storing data, this signal will be asserted. So we are basically saying that FIFO should be ready and this FIFO shouldn't be empty, then we are ready to give some data. That's the logic used. Again, uh, this FIFO is a first word for true FIFO, FWFT FIFO. Uh, again, the reason being, in case of AXI stream, when we say we have data available, basically data valid, the data should be already on the data bus. If we use traditional FIFOs, it will be having one block read latency. Because of that, this condition won't be satisfied. That's why we use a FWFT FIFO here, which basically has zero read latency. Okay, so the data will be prefetched and kept at the output of FIFO. Because of that FIFO will be, I mean, data will be already available. Again, you will have to go through the code to understand uh, what is happening. Simulate a few times to get an idea. Same way we have image writer also, which is the reverse logic. So that is getting the image data. This data is coming from uh, the mapper. So what our data is coming from mapper and the data valid. That data is initially stored in a FIFO, uh, which has an 8-bit input. The output from FIFO is 32-bit, which is used for writing to the DDR. Basically, this image reader and image writer IPs, you can use it in many projects wherever you have to read or write from DDR, you will be able to use it instead of using a, a DMA controller. So in case of write, the first size is set up only at 16, which first operation will be 16. So again, basically, idea is whenever there is sufficient data in the FIFO, uh, uh, it will write to the DDR. Except in the last first transfer, where it, it is not necessary the total image size is a multiple of the birth size. So in that case, uh, the last size, uh, right size might not be uh, this birth size. It could be less than that also. Again, you can go through the logic how it is done. So in order to implement this last first, uh, we are also using the programmable empty feature of signing cipher. I'll be sharing the code so you can look at it, how it is working. Uh, so basically, we instantiate uh, image reader, uh, entire histogram equalizer, as well as image writer to another file, which is uh, which is the XI light. IP template provided by Zyli. This file comes from Zyli, the basic IP template, which we have seen in the previous video. Whenever you generate a XI custom IP, XI Lite custom IP, this template is provided. So we instantiate all of them there. And few things uh, which are connected here, for example, yeah, so this is the start signal, which is going to our control logic. That start signal is connected to slave reg zero. So I'm using slave reg zero as my control register. With zero of slave reg zero will basically tell the IP to start the operation. So that is what is uh, connected here. 
same way image right uh, there will be a signal right back now, this signal is asserted when it stores the entire image in the DDR. So once the entire image is stored in DDR, the signal will become high, and that signal is stored in leverage one. So leverage one basically acts like a data register. Same way, when write down is uh, asserted, leverage zero, which is the control register, that is auto cleared. The software will set the start bit. IP will clear the start bit once the write operation is done. This part is for the processor to write to the register, these two. This part, basically, the IP is writing to the register. Now, image reader that requests the DDR start address, basically, where is the image stored? That software should provide through slave register to. Same way, image writer it needs to know where the processed image should be stored. That info is provided through Slaverage 3. So we are using Slaverage 0 as control register, Slaverage 1 as status register, Slaverage 2 as image start address, and Slaverage 3 as uh, where the processed image should be stored. So we are basically using four registers here. In addition to this, this write down is also connected to the insert, but not directly connected. Leverage one with zero, which will be asserted when write down is high, is connected to O interrupt. So our IP will also generate an interrupt once it finishes image processing operation. This is a small testbed module which is used for uh, evaluating the IP. Basically, uh, the test bench, it opens an input file in binary format. So the image that we want to test, we need to convert it into a, a raw binary image. Okay, I'll be using a small open TV script to do that. We'll see that later. It basically opens that binary file. And whenever it gets a read request from our IP, it sends a burst to 256. And each burst contains four bytes because it is matching with our hardware. Uh, in this particular case, our IP, it is reading twice uh, from the memory. So in order to emulate that, once our test bed sends the entire image, it closes that image file and it reopens. So when the IP requests for a second time, uh, it will be again able to send from the beginning of the file. So the, that's the technique used here. Uh, since I didn't want to write a full AXI light master, I am using this. Uh, hierarchical access, which is available in Medlock using the dot operator for directly setting the image uh, image address for storing the process image, as well as to set my target in flavorage server. These two, uh, they don't have any significance here. Uh, we are not using them here, but this is required. Yeah, for starting processing. So I am setting it one and waiting for the run signal from IP. This is like the input coming from the IP. Once interrupt is received, I am clearing it. This is kind of emulating our software, which we will be writing later. Same way, whenever I get the data from the IP, uh, if you look at the signal, this is the same as a write value. So basically, our IP is writing to memory. And we are ready to accept that one. What uh, uh, data is being given by our IP, we are storing it in another file so that we can open and see it out. This is the basic IP design. Uh, this image prepared.py. 
that is the Python script based on OpenCV used for converting image to a binary uh, file, raw binary file. Because this is in binary, but I want to convert it into raw binary. So we open it, read it, and so uh, that's it. Uh, to demonstrate that, yeah, so here is our input image, uh, this one. So I'll be running this script. And then this input dot bin, which is a raw binary. We can use any editor and see that. Image file. The size of this file will be same as our image. Uh, there is another script also, raw image, which is used to read a raw image and show it as an image. The again, idea is quite simple. We read the binary file and we reshape it to the size of the archive image and display it. Example, if I use it on this binary, Those are input image because that's why Android has used here. So this file we'll be using for simulation as well as later for testing it on hardware also. Oh now in Vivado, first of all, I'll be going through the uh, IP flow so generating the IP. You can refer to the previous videos on how it is done. We start with a custom IP design with a AXI light interface. Now to that module, we'll be adding a AXI full stick uh, interface also. Um, yeah. We, we, we add all our files, all our logic here, and we convert it into an IP. Again, how how the spot mapping is done and how to generate this second interface, which is an AXI marker that is discussed in the previous videos. You can refer to that. So all the AXI marker signals are here. The uh, interrupt signal is also here. I added my test bench also. So first we will run a simulation and then When you simulate, remember to keep the binary file in the Excel folder of your IT project. I will just input this thing and put it in the Excel folder. Here yeah, you can see that I'm going as close. And this is where the first part is over. Now this might be the second part, part time. We are getting that at some point. I feel so. Okay.
have one two there so let me just that bit is out dot pin in the active folder and we don't get and see whether our output is correct or not so in the drawing here uh, i've changed the file name as out dot pin Here is our expected out. Okay, so functionally the IP is working fine. So next task is to build an entire system, evaluate it on hardware. Okay, so this IP is packaged. I add it to another project. Like we always do, main project. You see, we've got our twenty twenty one uh, this time, and the main project. There is our IP and uh, the slave part of the IP is connected to the purpose master port of our PS. The master port from our IP that is connected to one of HP ports of uh, Ring. And I have also added an ILA core just in case somebody wants to see the new concept. Usually it was done for debugging. But we can also see how sequence are going. The input is also added to ILA. So the hardware design is uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, the system level design is pretty straightforward. We have our IP, connect the slave port of our IP to PSTP port so that we can access the registries and connect the master port to HP port so that our IP can access the video memory and connect the input also to the interference and power PNC. Okay, then we go through the flow and we finally generate the bitstream. I have already generated it. Uh, then we can export our hardware to ITs and we can start developing our software. And we quickly going through the driver code. So the code for our IT it is written as a uh, as a driver. So we have stq.h where we represent our uh, hardware instance as a structure here uh, which stores the information like what is the big address what is the image size we are using and the point is in the data memory where the source image is stored and where the source of image will be stored so the software is quite uh, scalable uh, there is no image size restriction here it can be of any kind not like our hardware and here is the address map of our ip so slave rich zero is controlled slave rich one is status uh, this is where we store for ddr address of email chatting address this is the chatting address of the process email then uh, there are a bunch of apis for using the ip so the first api uh, that we might be calling is init IP, where you will pass the base address of the IP, which you will be getting from experimenters.h file. You also pass the image file and the point of the variable, which you will generate. So in the init function, actually I am allocating buffers in DDR for storing the image. It uses dynamic memory allocation, uh, again, to make things uh, scalable and every memory allocation is used. So the side effect of this is in your link uh, you should keep high value for heat. And the default value is hex 2000. Uh, that is not sufficient for storing this uh, image data. So you have to increase the heap size. I have increased it quite a bit. Anyway, the code will check if the memory allocation failed or not. In case it 
same paper thread is not enough deep to uh, bring my page on top. So we allocate my uh, buffer. So taking one more point, you can see. So we allocate buffer. We are allocating one KB more than the image size. Again, there are certain reasons why it is done like that. One reason being, in case of AXI read, uh, there is a requirement AXI read operation does not cost a uh, four kilobyte uh, uh, bounty. That means when our IP request for data, the starting address plus the total per size. In our case, we are always using one KB when we are making a read request that could not cross the four kilobyte memory boundary. So in order to guarantee that the idea used is uh, we make sure the starting address of the image is one kilobyte aligned. It starts with a multiple of one kilobyte. If it starts with a multiple of one kilobyte, and if we always request for one kilobyte data, it guarantees that it will never cross the four kilobyte bound. It will exactly terminate at the boundary. So that is why it is done like that. So 1024 additional is uh, allocated. And here we are making sure it is 1 KB aligned. Okay, by adding that address with this particular mask. So if you look at this mask, it's lower than bit per zero. That guarantees that the strategy of the one kilobyte alert. This is the technique used to make sure uh, uh, buffers are not uh, aligned with the integral one. Now, this one thing. Now, these two APIs, they will uh, help us with the uh, buffer and process from that structure. So, we are passing the phone in the flow structure from there it will be using the buffer and process. Uh, this function is used for starting our IP. So basically, it will store these two buffer addresses in the in the registers. Uh, the X buffer and R buffer registers are the which we have seen here. In the registers we store it. After that, to the control register, it writes one. That will enable our IP and it will start processing. This API is used to check whether IP is busy or not. That means whether it is processing any image or not, as of now. Again, idea used is pretty straightforward. It reads the control register and it looks at the uh, bit zero of control register. If bit zero is set, if we are actually sitting here, if bit zero is set, that means it hasn't done with the processing. In the hardware code, if you remember, once the IP completes processing, it will automatically clear the control register. So in that case, this bit will be zero, so it will return zero, otherwise it will return one, indicating the IP is BP. Now this function, again, if you are using polling instead of info to make sure whether IP has done with the processing, we can use this function. Uh, basically, what it does is it, it keeps on reading the status register, or oh, sorry, the control status register, uh, until it it, uh, it becomes one. And so once IP finishes processing, it makes control register equal to zero, the status register equal to one. Other ways also possible, you can keep on holding until the control register becomes zero, or keep on holding until the status will just become one. Uh, once it becomes one from software, we write the status register and clear it. So this is in effect uh, clearing the info also because the info pin is directly connected to bit zero status register. So you need to write the status register and make it zero for the info to the DF letter. In case we are using info, if we are using polling mark, uh, we have to make it zero so that we can reuse the IP again Otherwise, the status register will remain one for ever. And next time when you send an image, you will immediately find status register is one. But that doesn't correspond to this new image. It might be corresponding to the previous image. So it's important to clear the status register. 
Now this is a part of the ISR, which will be used for the IP. So here what we do, uh, you will see where it is used later. Here the only operation done is clearing the engine of it, which is nothing but that is registered. And this is used for uh, deleting the driver instance. Basically, it frees the PX and R. In the main code, I am using interface flow. So, in the main, uh, first we call the init histogram. Uh, we pass the base address on image side. Image side I am using is like A644 IP. After that, yeah, I am printing the buffer addresses. Why that is required, we will see later. So, what is the PX buffer address? What is the RX buffer address? I am simply printing them. Then we call the interrupt setup. Okay, in interrupt setup, again, standard flow. And we are using GIC in controller from violin. We need to use the HMAT GIC and we need to put our IPs IRQ with our IP ISR. So this is the ISR for my IP, which is pretty uh, clear. And we are also passing a point up to the you know, structure, which will be passed to the ISR whenever the ISR is being called. When the ISR is called, this callback reference will actually correspond to a point up to the switch, which represents the right. And we enabled it. So this is standard infrastructure uh, for value We need to link our IP IR2 with its IR. That point is important. Now in the ISR, first thing that we do is we disable the infra from our IP in the further infra within a standard package. Then we are calling this function. So this is a one function that we have seen before uh, here, which basically does the status bit clearing operation. Again, I could have done this operation here itself. This is just to demonstrate uh, how 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 we get drivers from the third party usually. So when we get drivers for IPs from third party, uh, many a time it is possible part of the ISR will be Played by the developer and part of the ISR will be written by you. So this is to demonstrate how it is done. So within the main ISR, we are calling this function, which is provided by the third party. So it might be doing certain operation depending upon the IP. If they want to abstract from you and uh, a detail operation, you will be able to do in your own ISR. So as far as we are concerned, there is nothing to do in our ISR. I am only printing a uh, done. That's it. That's the uh, thing that we are doing. And we re enable the. Okay, so disable the infra. Now then basically service the infra and re enable the infra. Again, just to demonstrate what is a good problem for you. So that's it about the uh, software development. Now we will directly test it on hardware. The IPO set seven development mode this time. It will run on anything or thing that this of platform or uh, same code. We don't have to change anything. Let's start to modifying the link system. So first of all, okay, we programs our hardware. And uh, then we can run the software. So, so for testing the code, first we need to score the image in the DDR, and only our IP can force the thing. But I don't know the address where it should be stored because the buffers are dynamically allocated. So that's the reason why the uh, why the stack addresses are printed here. So you can either uh, 
use a debug mode and go step by step and reach here and find the address, then transfer the image, or you can put a breakpoint and uh, go there. Whatever method you use, or you can run your entire code once. Of course, the first output will be wrong. It will be getting some random data from the data. But you will see the address. So that address you can download the image and rerun it. Because in 99.99 .99 case, since we are using standalone operating system, uh, the buffer addresses allotted will remain the same. So that is no need to change it. Oh, what I will do, I, I will I'll simply run my code. Again, you have to create a run configuration, things like that, which I explained in the previous video. I'm not going through them again. I'm just running my code one. So when I run my code, I will wait for the address. When I run my code, here I found out what are the Address. This is the X plus address. This is R X plus address. Actually, our IP is here in the tool, so try the done is also coming here. Okay, since our code ran once, so we can look at the ILA also. Okay, so I am uh, simply triggering on the input signal to see what is happening and the trigger position. Maybe I will keep it at 3000 because I am more interested in what was happening before the image. We are going to download the image to VDR using XSCP console. It is discussed in the previous video, one of the videos it is there. So here basically data transfer happens over JTAG. Okay, data is transferred through JTAG, it goes to the debug port. Uh, from there it will be routed to the VDR memory. So the syntax is DAO hyphen data followed by the file name. I'll be using our input file. I'll use uh, input.pin. Followed by the address where you want to store it. We want to store it in 108 400. So that is being downloaded and on the that I stored that. If you wish, you can read and see also through access accessibility. So if I do memory read 0x. And so eight four hundred and say fun if you want to see the location. This is what is in the memory HC nine five nine five nine seven. And I already have the binary. I can compare it here. Here it is HC nine five nine five nine seven. You may find that this is inverted, that's not the case because it is stored in liquidity format. You you feel like that. So the image data is there. Okay, since it is there, now I will rerun my code. Again. Okay. Rerunning. Okay, I got the input again. And in the ILA, also I can see uh, here is the input signal going high. Here it is going now. That means my ISR, it made the input signal low. And all the uh, boxes that you are seeing here, they are write uh, operations which are happening from our IP for storing the process image in the memory. Okay. Verse of 16 is what is happening here. Now we need to check the output image, whether it is correct or not. For doing that, again, many methods could be there. One easiest one is to use this uh, dump memory utility uh, in YK. Yeah. First, we choose a processor. So we can choose, okay, and the APU, MP Core 0, I am choosing. File location, okay, where the data should be stored after reading. 
So here it's in the same folder. Let me make this last one. Hardware outsourcing. Next one, okay, starting address from where we should read. That's why we have the Rx buffer start address. And finally, how much data we want to read. That will be the same as our image size. 14 or IC. This one. You can see once we configure all of them, and if I click OK, it will read it. Depends upon how much data you are reading, it may take some time. Our case is quite fast because we are reading only 300 pages. Reads and stores it in that. Yeah. And that's why. So now I will check it. So in my show image, I will change it to. If one other output has been when you try it, you will see it matches exactly with our simulation output, which is the expected output. Okay, so basically IP is hardware validated also. Okay, so I'm I'm releasing the source code you can. By it yourself, you can improvise also. Like I said, one good impression will be to uh, make the IP work with any image size, no size, it must be hard coded. In driver that is already done, in hardware, we need a certain modification. Another doubt that can arise is uh, why we have to sort the image in DDR. Of course, initially it should be in the DDR, but when we stream it for the first time, why don't we? store it temporarily within the IP itself. And uh, next time, instead of streaming it from media, why can't we read it from the internal memory of the IP itself? That is possible, provided the image size is quite small. So even 64480, it might be possible. But uh, as the size of the image increases, the size of this buffer will also increase. So it might not be quite scalable. Uh, that is the reason. It is streamed second time also from DDR that may add like latency to the oral processing, but this is more uh, viable, scalable solution, I guess. Okay, so thank you.